Good quail habitat is a mixture of brush and fairly open grasslands. They've got to have the brush cover to hide themselves from the predators during the bigger part of the day to protect themselves from heat and from the cold wind. And then that cover at ground level is really important to them as they're out foraging. They need to be able to have that screening cover to hide them from their various enemies as well. So as I work with landowners and quail managers, try to give them an idea of what the ideal quail landscape should look like, I find myself referring to a softball and what I call the softball habitat evaluation technique. In this little exercise, the softball is the quail. It's about the same size as a quail, and it has the same dilemmas as a quail because anytime it's exposed, somebody's trying to catch it or whack it. So I want you to think about a softball field. A softball field, let's think about the dimensions of that. It's going to be a little bit less than two acres in size. It's going to be roughly 275 feet from home plate down the right field line. It takes a real good hitter to knock a softball 300 feet. A quail doesn't like to fly over about 300 feet. So that's the scope or the scale that I want us to be thinking about is the level of a softball field. Now then, how many defensive players are on a softball team at one time? There's 10. If you recall, there's an extra defenseman called a rover. Envision where those 10 people are lined up on that field. And we want to have a quail house or a protective covert. We want to have a quail house located everywhere we've got a defensive player on that field. We ought to have that structured such that we can throw that softball in the air from one quail house to the next. So just like those softball players when they throw the, the softball around the horn after they've made an out, that's how we want those quail houses positioned on the landscape. A little denser on the infield, a little more open in the outfield. Those quail houses ought to be about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, minimally the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So picture those, 10 of those scattered out across that two acres. Now then, think about the area inscribed by the base paths. 60 feet on a softball field from home plate to first base. So we're inscribing an area there of 3,600 square feet, a little less than a tenth of an acre. Now we're going to talk about nesting habitat. In order to have good nesting habitat, we need about a minimum of 25 suitable nesting clumps within the infield. When I say a suitable nesting clump, we're thinking about something like a little blue stem, or some type of bunch grass, about the size of a basketball, ideally. So 25 of those was inside the infield. Another thing we think about is using the softball. It's 46 feet from the pitcher's mound to home plate. I'm going to toss that softball pitching distance, 46 feet, and then we're going to see whether or not I can see it from where I'm standing. And we want to know, does it stick upon impact or does it roll anywhere from six inches to six feet? In that particular situation, I can see the softball, and it did roll about four feet. That suggests to me, again, that in that particular situation, the cover was just a little lighter than what I'd like to see it ideally. If the softball sticks upon landing, the grass cover's too thick. If it rolls anywhere from six inches to six feet, we're in good shape. Now let's talk about nesting cover. The pitching mound is 46 feet from home plate. If I toss this softball pitching distance, 45 or 6 feet, and I can still see that softball from where I'm standing, that tells me I don't have enough ground cover. I need to reduce my stocking, reduce my grazing, rest it for a year or two to bring back my ground cover. Now, a lot of West Texas, during dry times, we could shoot that thing out of a howitzer and still be, see, be able to see that softball. So our grazing management is critically important for preserving and maintaining, developing that nesting habitat. A lot of people are mad at prickly pear, and boy, prickly pear can be a real pain. But if you look at your world through the eyes of a quail, it's hard to be too mad at prickly pear because quail will nest in prickly pear. And what a lot of our studies have shown is that quail that nest in prickly pear, those nests survive at about twice the rate of those quail that nest in grass, especially when grass is limited, as it often is during drought times out here. In order to be a good nesting clump of prickly pear, it ought to be the size of, about the size of two hula hoops. What the quail will do is, generally these prickly pear protect the grass from too close to grazing, so you've got some nesting substrate, some grass, protected by a thorny crown. 
like this, and, and it just helps provide some mechanical protection against their enemies. And where a quail would nest in, if I could just take a toe of my boot, kind of dig out an area in there, that'd be kind of the situation that a quail would nest in. When I make reference to a quail house, I'm talking about a loafing covert. Quail are going to use a situation like this from about mid-morning until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is where they're going to spend most of their day, loafing. It provides protection from their various enemies, and it's a really integral part of good quail habitat. A good loafing covert or quail house should be dense above, yet open at ground level. Dense above keeps the hawks away from them. Open at ground level allows me to inspect, see those mammalian predators that may be approaching. It ought to be the size at least of a VW Beetle. Uh, this particular case, it's about the size of an extended cab pickup truck. I like that one even better. There are a number of different species of plants that will satisfy our need here. In West Texas, one of the most common ones is called loat bush. Some people call it blue thorn or chaparral. It's an excellent quail house. Sand plum thickets are another good one in North Texas. You might have granjano thickets. You might have white brush. You might have wolfberry. There's actually about four different species of brush in this little complex right here, and that just helps it to be a good quail house. I've got loat bush, I've got wolfberry, I've got algerita, and I've got little leaf sumac. And all of those, it's not so much the species of plant, it's the growth form. Something head high, about the size of a pickup truck. A lot of our country is just too thick with brush for good quail habitat. This was the situation here five years ago. We brought a bulldozer in with a grubbing attachment, grubbed out most of the mesquite, and even some of the good quail houses because they were just too thick. My instructions to the dozer operator were this. I want you to clear those quail houses until we have one about every softball throw apart. And that left this kind of landscape. I can still toss that softball. I can see my bird dogs. I like it. Another thing I want to think about with our softball is asking yourself this. How many players are on a softball team, including those in the dugout? 12 to 15. That's about how many quail are in a cubby. And then if we think there's a lady or gentleman that stands behind the hind catcher, typically with a light blue shirt, call the umpire, and what is that person's function? What's his role? He's to determine if things are fair or foul, going to interpret the rules of the game, who's in, who's out, who's safe. Now think, in our game of quail, who is that individual? And that individual is the landowner. So it's up to the landowner's decisions relative to brush control, relative to stocking rate of grazing. Those are the kind of things that influence whether or not that quail is going to play ball or not.